Mike, you've had an amazing Hall of Fame career, which is still being written, but you had some something of an unorthodox start. You studied journalism in college. Can you can you tell me how you transitioned into the career of law? Yeah, I was um, I, I wanted to be a foreign correspondent back then. That was the whole Sandinista picture. You it's a little before your time, but there was a, a revolution going on and everybody coming out of University of Florida that wanted to be a journalist and wanted to do foreign correspondent was heading down there. Uh, I had a friend that, that said, look, before you make any kind of move, why don't you consider uh, law school? And it, it, you know, I guess law school always, always been in the back of my mind, but um, they said, I want you to meet somebody. And I went and down and met uh, a really important lawyer at this time. It's probably one of the most important uh, trial lawyers of his time. Um, he, had, he had developed uh, just a whole string of courtroom techniques that we still use today. His name was Perry Nichols. And he was, uh, he's actually from Miami, but he had a place. He raised cattle in uh, Arcadia, Florida which is a small cattle town down in central Florida, one of the places I lived. And I went down and met him. And, um, you know, after doing that and talking to him, uh, I came away pretty convinced that that was the thing that maybe fit me. And just his one of his points was that, you know, uh, you can you can have a, a law degree and still be a journalist. So that was kind of uh, that was the kind of thing that really moved me towards maybe fitting in that area. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you've written a number of books some fiction books. And, you know, let's let's talk about that. You know, how has the journalism background help you from a marketing and, and media perspective over your career? Yeah, it's been really helpful as you, you know, over the years, the last 22, 25 years, uh, I've been a, a MSNBC. I've been a regular contributor on MSNBC, Fox. I was uh, the liberal commentator on Fox for two, two and a half years. Uh, where it would be me and three other folks arguing with me. Right. And then and then from there, um, just a whole host of different um, programs that I've been on. Uh, Air America was something that was a, a, it was a liberal talk show program that it, it had. Uh, it was a network, actually. It had Al Franken, it had me, Janine Garofalo, Rachel Maddow, Chuck D, Steve Earle, uh, Sam Cedar. Just just a remarkable you know, group of folks that were liberal talkers. And it lasted a, it lasted a couple of years, but more importantly, those folks all ended up going into their area of journalism. Um, you know, of course, Rachel on MSNBC, all these uh, Garofalo still very active in politics. All of these folks, Shank Uger, which you probably know, he's uh, mm -hmm. the young Turks out, of, out in California. So uh, out of that came people that stayed in their area of journalism, at least in progressive, uh, progressive journalism. And then um, I, I've always thought it's important that lawyers have some diversity. And, and so I was always a writer. I, the, I started out with a couple of books that really weren't designed to be books. I used to give uh, speeches about, um, you know, that landed on the idea of quality of life, how, how important is quality of life for, uh, for a, a lawyer that's, stressed out from every kind of angle what's so important about that lawyer finding quality of life and i gave speeches about that and somebody said one time well why don't you just reduce some of that to a book and so out of there came a book called in search of atticus finch i think mm -hmm. it's in its fourth or fifth printing right now they use it in law schools and other places but that was a product of me sending out questionnaires all over the country to lawyers and finding out what it is that they could do to improve their quality of life. And, and in there, something was very obvious. Lawyers who do one thing, lawyer, 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 and that's all they do. They don't have any other horizons. They don't have any other aspects to their lives are very, very unhappy. Uh, their quality of life usually is not what it should be. And their burnout rate is tremendous. So I, I've always tried to find things that took me away from uniquely the, the practice of law. And, and I, I thought, well, you know, we handle cases that are just r remarkable cases. You know, we the tobacco litigation started with right. this firm. Uh, I think we've handled 58 of the largest ph pharmaceutical cases in the country, uh, you know, 12 or 13, 14 of the biggest environmental cases. So I, I said, well, why don't I take that and put it into uh, 
into a series of books. The matter of fact, one's coming out in about two months. It's about human, the human trafficking case that we're handling. So the, the idea is that most lawyers want to write about themselves. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. they want to do this biography stuff and it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, if you look at the numbers, their family reads it, their friends read it, maybe, or they tell them that they read it, right? but they don't really, they don't really care. So what, what I wanted to do is I wanted to tell the story uh, of these very important cases and how, what the impact was socially on these, these very important cases, but I wanted to do it with fiction. So I created a character uh, named Nicholas Dika Thomas, and that character just spins all the way through what is now coming up the fourth book. Um, yeah, so I've, I, I didn't do it only because I had a, a, a journalism background. I did it because out of the first time I took a look at what the impact was for, for lawyers and the quality of life, it was very clear to me. You've got to have some diversity in your life. You just have to. And so that's that's why I spent so much time in those areas of TV media, radio media, written media. And um, it, it's worked out for me pretty well. I, I love all of that. I just think, you know, when you get in the grind, you, you got to have some some diversity. You got to be a little uncomfortable and do different types of things to have these experiences. And so is, you know, is the book, is it more you know, your main character, the protagonist, is it like a hero's journey of them throughout this like arc? Um, yeah, he's, it's a, it's a hero that is, um, it, it's, it's a, it, it's broken in so many ways. It's not a, there, there's no, uh, you know, hero worship about this character. He's human. Uh, he's, uh, you know, very talented trial lawyer that's done a lot of important things but he's human nonetheless. And all the characters are human because you know, the trick about fiction is you have to have some plausibility. I think sometimes right. in fiction writing, they create these characters. You go, eh, I don't really know anybody like that. And so all of the characters, there's a character in the, the set, uh, third book. It's called, uh, yeah, that her name is Janina, Janina uh, uh, Ravalo. She's a, she's a, a broken <laughs> character but you do love her and right. you know you come away thinking wow you know look at what she's accomplishing and um it's called a, a law and vengeance and that tells you about her character gina romano it, her her character is just this bizarre character that seems to get things done but it's more realistic it's kind of a composite of lawyers i've met over the years. So that's fun to me, you know, just right. kind of jumping into that kind of thing. Yeah. And, you know, writing a book. So I'm in the process of that. And it is, if it's, if you don't have a passion for what you're writing, it can be so tedious because it takes mm. a lot of work on its own. Um, you know, jumping, staying on the, the, uh, on the media side, I just kind of want to ask you a few follow-up questions on, on getting back to that. And then we'll jump in uh, to mass torts and mass torts made perfect. You know, you know, what, what's your advice for an attorney who wants to start making media a part of their marketing strategy? It's, you know, there's an outlet, right? There's, there's, mm. there's consumers and they already have this audience, but they just don't select anyone to get on their yeah. show. Yeah. So here's, here's the advice. Corporate media is dead or dying. Okay. You just have to believe me. It's, it's people are cutting cables. They, they, the credibility of corporate media is in the tank right now. Right. And so things like you're doing right now, what, what, what the things that you talk about in a podcast, people can't get enough podcasts. They, they just they want to hear these peculiar stories. They want to hear what corporate media can't talk about. I do a show now called America's Lawyer. It shows all over the world. Now, wh why did I choose to? And it's Russian television. Why did I choose to go there? Well, because when I was doing media with the corporate media, uh, you know, I worked with um, Ed Schultz, who was a anchor for a long time. And we'd be getting ready to tell a story. It might be that Bear has a product out there that's killing women by the hundreds. It might be that, uh, that DuPont is destroying an entire ecosystem. 
and we'd be in the in the in the close count. It'd be 10, 9, 8, and then at five, they'd say, Pap, you got to kill the story, go to con law or something else. And that happened so many times. Even with my partner, I, people don't realize this, but Joe Scarborough used to be my law partner, and we helped him get that job with MSNBC. But even when I was with him, the the corporate impact for corporate media, you know, the advertisers had such power. Uh, the corporate media can't tell a story, Chris, right. because their advertisers won't let them or because their political involvement, they, they are, they're, they're uh, tribal about their politics. You know, I'm Republican. I have to tell the Republican side, I'm Democrat. And I got to tell the Democrat side, people are, are tired of it. You should see the numbers on it. They are tired of it. So what does this do? It creates an opportunity to come in and do something different, exactly like you're doing. Let me tell you a quick story. 20 years ago, I was going to Mass Torch Made Perfect, doing my opening, saying, you need to do this. I was afraid that was going to happen. Did I get you back? I yeah. Back? Oh, my audio cut out just for a moment. So... So uh, we are still recording so many 20 years ago. Okay, so 20, 20 years ago in Vegas, I was telling lawyers, go home, start, get to a local TV station, buy an hour, do something where you're creating your own media. Do a radio show, create your own media. And then when podcasting came along, I, I create your own media. When uh, internet came along, create your own media. Some folks listen to me and it has really worked out very, very well for them. And others, here's the problem, Chris, it's tough to tell a lawyer to think about something different. They want to grab that same, you know, whatever's been handed down to them. They just want to embrace that. They're afraid to say, no, I reject that, or I might accept it, but I want to modify it and make it better. It's so difficult to get lawyers to do that. You may not know this, but Clarence Darrow, probably one of the greatest lawyers of his time, he hated lawyers. He was one of the most impressive lawyers of his time. He said they're not creative thinkers. They're afraid to innovate. They don't read enough. They don't accept, They don't excel in areas beyond the law. And, and his point was, we have to do all of that to be sustainable. Now, that's not, not just sustainable in your practice, but sustainable as an individual that has any kind of cultural impact. You can't, you can't covey up in one little corner and say, okay, I'm going to have 1-800-AUTO, give me a call. You, know, you can't do that. Right. You have to expand the things you think about. I think that's a fantastic point. One of the things I've noticed is individuals that have listened to my podcast, they, they have this sense of trust. I've already developed this rapport with them. And the other thing is that I really appreciate, appreciate about what you're saying is if you just do what everybody else is doing, you'll never stand out. But if you do something different or have a different opinion, just by the nature of being different, you automatically stand out. Yeah. And your, your point, Chris, is uh, this is really going to shock you. This, this is a real big shocker. When I started first writing books, I sent out questionnaires all over the country, 2000 questionnaires. And the response was amazing what they sent back. Uh, and it's difficult to get people to, to answer questions, but they did answer these. And then I gave them to a couple of shrinks who are very good at what they do. And they look through it. And I, and I said, well, what, what is it? What is it that sometimes holds lawyers back from doing extraordinary things? You know what it is? fear of rejection, fear of failure. Uh, and here's, here's the way it was described. They come, up in an, they come up in a setting where maybe they're president of their high school class and then they're president of their fraternity or president of their sorority and their you know, homecoming queen. And all they've known their entire life was acceptance, acceptance and adulation, okay? All of a sudden they're put into a setting where they, to, to grow, they have to take chances. They have to face rejection that what they're talking about may be rejected. And they're not good at it. They're not good at it. The ones with thick skin understand that everything about what we do as a lawyer is based on a, an underpinning of law of average. Some things we do, some cases we handle are gonna be great, 
we're not, they're not all going to be great. Some people are going to tell us, no, I don't want to go to trial. You know, lawyers think I don't want to go to trial because the jury may tell me, tell me no. Well, you know, try 10 cases and you're going to win six. Four are going to tell you no, but you can't be afraid of rejection. And that holds true day to day for lawyers. They're afraid to move outside that narrow little comfort zone. Am I doing the same thing that Mary's doing down the street? Oh, all she's doing is workers' comp and automobile. I can't take on anything beyond that. That is right. wrong thinking. And it is so tough to break through. Jeez, I, I couldn't agree more. And just by what you said, just I, I think of so many firms that even we work with that, that don't try a lot of cases. So they're getting yeah. the low ball offers, right? Even yeah. if you go, you know, those. So you, you start winning, you're going to get some better offers for the ones you don't take the kit to court. And I, I think about, all these individuals that are first in to a particular niche. I know we're going to talk about mass torts. You know, we, we had, um, I'm trying to think Levin uh, from the nursing home abuse, you know, where he mm. really embraced and went all in there. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and he just, he automatically stood out because he was first in. And I mean, don't you love that? Yeah. It's don't amazing. you love that? I mean, here, here's this, there's this guy saying, I don't want to do what everybody on my street is doing got damn cars falling out of the sky, crushing people. And Hey, call 1-800 auto. Crush. Who does that? Who says, right. yeah, this is, this is my life. Or, or, or Levin who says, you know, I can, I can have a better social impact. Okay. I can do really well by doing some good. Okay. And, and it is, it's very difficult to get that idea across because that comfort zone, the fear of rejection, is there's always work in there. Let's, let's talk about Mass Torts Made Perfect. So you, your firm just went all in on Mass Torts and just really embraced and, and are doing exactly what we're talking about here. And you're, you're taking on some of these just gigantic companies, you know what was your idea, you know, moving into this area? How did you just fully embrace it? I mean, was there a little bit of anxiety and risk that you were making the oh, right decision? Yeah. Massive, massive anxiety, massive risk. I mean, you know, I mean, we're in the middle of opioids right now. My God, you, you know, when a firm's spending $50 million to, for an idea, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the risk. But, but we look at everything like a trial, as a trial lawyer would look, okay? When I look at a project, I'm saying, I'm looking at one right now. Uh, I'm looking at Paraquat. Now, there's real problems with Paraquat, you understand. The warning on Paraquat is massive. It's like, you know, it, everything except your eyeballs might pop out and your head might explode. Don't use this stuff. So it sounds bad, right? For the applicator stand, from the applicator stand, it sounds bad. And then from the uh, overspray, where people simply, they're not applicators, but they, they're they people out there that might be exposed. But here's what sometimes people don't understand. You have to anticipate. You have to be able to visualize what do the documents probably look like for Chevron? What did they know about the development of Parkinson's disease and its relationship to these chemicals long before they ever made it known? So at some point, there, there's a notion. And notion is documents have the ability to drive damages, all right? So I don't simply look at a project and say, oh, God, this is... Now, Paraquat is a great example. I didn't just jump into Paraquat and say, yeah, I'm going to do it. I, I, I'm, I'm analyzing it even today. How, how is the case going to try? I'm always trying to visualize what happens in trial. And if you talk to most trial lawyers, I mean, people who really do try these cases, they're going to tell you the same thing. They, they project and they anticipate and they're able to look into a project and say, you know what, I bet on cross-examination, it's going to be a bloodbath when I have that person on the other side of, of, of the table with me. When I start talking about their documents, when I do what we call it, uh, we develop something called an attack document bounce. It's very specific to what we do. It's unusual. People don't, you know, but when we say, when I look at it, I'm always saying, how is that going to work in this case? And, you know, I could be wrong on Paraguay. You know, we, we've, we've, we've been wrong one time and, you know, in, in 21 years advising at Mass Torch, and that was on Accutane, 
But understand, we still won the first three cases tried in Accutane. Eight million, four million, seven. You know, we won. We won those cases. But then we had the judge that was a reasonable, just middle middle line judge. She 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 moved on and she died ultimately. And we were uh, it was replaced by a Nazi. You know, it's just this guy was a fruitcake. And so obviously that changes those. That's right. something you can't anticipate. It's a intervening cause that you just don't right. even have to see coming. So we've been pretty good about calling them. Yeah. And, you know, I love that what you're saying, because I hear that a lot in sports, you know, there's a lot of sports analogies where the greatest players, they visualize kind of the outcome and how the game's going to go. And, you know, these top performers like, Hey, I already knew that I was going to be successful. And I, I, I appreciate that. Y'all a lot of times hear retrospectives, 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 mm -hmm. what went right, mm -hmm. what went mm -hmm. wrong, you mm -hmm. know, postmortems. So mm -hmm. I think I can really appreciate that you're doing like, an advanced retrospective like yeah it's that's a good way to put it it really is yeah it, it's just a it's a percentage analysis isn't it mm -hmm. do i have a better is it a better is it a better than 60 percent chance that when i'm in a deposition in a real real well-organized attack deposition that i'm going to rock their world you see and that's the way i look at everything love it you know, and, and I got a couple more questions. Let's talk about Mass Torts Made Perfect. You know, I'd love to hear the story about how that got started. You know, was it, hey, how are we going to get attention and thought leadership? What are we going to do? You know, what kind of. Yeah, yeah, it? that's a great story. Um, yeah. OK, so a friend of mine, uh, we actually were roommates in uh, in law school, uh, not in law school, but an undergrad at University of Florida. It was John Morgan uh, who, you know, built more of a single event kind of practice but he and i uh, you know we, we we were good friends and so we were young i mean kids man just starting to practice law and i had written a book and um and so what he had this idea is how to build a million dollar practice i said sure john let's let's give it a shot and so we we start showing up in cities all over the country uh, Atlanta, maybe we got 100 people. We go to LA and we got 25. <laughs> I mean, you never know what you're going to get, right? But there's this big ad talking about us, what we've done, why they ought to come. And so out of that, um, again, John, John was more single event. You know, he does auto and comp and that kind of thing. But I, I, I wanted, I, I came from asbestos. I tried asbestos cases all over the country. And so I said, well, you know, I kind of want to do this, this mass tort thing. And so um, I put together Mass Torts Made Perfect because I thought in my mind that you had to create energy around this. Because when we started, Chris, you had these, these characters that weren't even trial lawyers. They were class action wogs. All they knew how to do was class action. Hell, they'd never taken a deposition for God's sakes. You know, they couldn't walk in. If they walked in a courtroom to have to try a case, they'd pass out. But those were the people running what was kind of, you call it class action, mass torts, kind of a hybrid. And one time in Atlanta, uh, one of them was on the stage, a guy named Stan Chesley. And I had, uh, I had a consortium of lawyers that had sent me a lot of breast implant cases. And he was up on stage with his cadre of, you know, class action wogs talking about how he's going to settle this. And that. and I picked up a mic. I said, Mr. Chesley, you're not going to do anything with my cases. I've got more cases than you have got. I'm going to try my cases. And you know what? This is a new day where it comes to class action and mass tort. The right after that is when we started mass torts made perfect. And it just continued to grow, man. I mean, it just love it. It was, it, you know, we wanted to attract lawyers. I mean, real trial lawyers to try and mass tort cases, not these, you know, brief writers. Right. Love it. Love it. And, uh, you know, you've had some past speakers, you've had some entertainers, you've had Bill Clinton, Joe Namath, David Blaine, Whoopi Goldberg, you know, who's one of the most memorable people that's came to uh, mass torts made perfect for their performance. I think it, well, un, un, unfortunately, he didn't make it there. We did it with mass with well, two in the last two were uh, Al Pacino, who I interviewed and um, uh, Matthew McConaughey. I mean, my God, I mean, you know, sitting there interviewing Al Pacino, this icon. 
and he wanted to talk. I mean, I think if he had been Vegas, he would have talked for two hours. I had to say, Mr. Pacino, you know, we got to move on. <laughs> so, so, so That's amazing. I mean, th there's a lot of people like that, that we've been involved with, uh, you know, on the, on the, uh, <laughs> On the uh, athletic side, probably Terry Bradshaw, Joe Namath, what an incredible person, man. We'd be, you know, I, I was, I remember having dinner with him and his knees are in terrible shape, Chris. I mean, he's always in pain, but people would come up to him and whoever it was, he would stand up and you could see just the pain in his, but he signed anything they wanted to sign. One couple came up and they said, well, one of, one of, the, one of the people attending the conference, said, Mr. Namath, would you sing happy birthday to my oh, wife? Man. And I'm going, oh, my God. But he did. So, so oh, that's I mean, amazing. The, I, Ellie Wiesel. I mean, how do you beat that? I mean, the guy that, that wrote Night, you know, the, uh, the survivor of Auschwitz that tells the Holocaust story. We have had every iteration you know, from Bill Maher, then you jump over to Ellie Wiesel and, you know, you've got all of these folks that just add quality to that program. And um, we'll always do that. You know, we, people think, well, these guys must make a lot of, we don't make money on that. We lose. I, I think, I think every program ends up costing us in addition to what everybody pays probably ends up costing us $450,000. I mean, the opening party, the opening party, we sim we we typically spend anywhere between three hundred and fifty and four hundred thousand dollars for drinks and hors d'oeuvres. So, yeah, that's incredible. So, I would say that's probably the epitome of that loss leader, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know? it is. It is. That, we we joke about that. What an expensive loss leader, huh? Yeah, and I uh, the other thing funny too is you know if you're the guy behind Pacino, like hey, you go tell him. You go tell him. Stop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, now, it's been a fun experience, man. Uh, my daughter is now practicing law with me and she's going to step into some of that leadership uh, along with Troy Rafferty, who's uh, I recruited Troy Rafferty practice law with us uh, kind of about maybe 20, 25 years ago. And as soon as he, as soon as he walked in, man, I said, this is, this is the one, this is the, this is somebody who's going to be there to, to grow this place long after i'm gone he's just a remarkable trial lawyer just a great lawyer all the way around so so we're planning it we're planning ahead that's incredible and and on that our our final question here is you know you know what's on what else is on the horizon for for mike papantonio well i think my obligation right now is uh, we have so many employees you know we've got tons of employees got tons of lawyers and employees and paralegal secretaries um and so there's a responsibility to those people, isn't there? You don't just say, well, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go home now. I've had a great career. There's nothing else I want to do. And so you have to, you have to take that whether you want to or not and say, I've got to stay in this game. You know, I've got to make sure that these people have a secure future and what I do matters. The decisions I make matters. Uh, the, the trials that I win or lose that matters. So it's not like you can just, um, when you're so committed to something for so long, you can't just, you know, throw in the towel and go home. Now you can take, as you may know, I take extended time off. I mean, I'll jump on my boat and go to the islands or something like that, mm -hmm. but I don't, uh, the, the idea of me saying, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go home now. It's, it's not likely. That speaks a, a tremendous amount to, about your integrity, and I really appreciate that. That's very mm -hmm. admirable, and and I think your staff they they see that and they feel confident and secure. I mean, it's just got to bring the stress levels down. Yeah, they're a great staff. I mean, it's a family. My paralegals have been with me thirty years. My secretary thirty seven years. I mean, they <laughs> they stay here. You know That's I mean? incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. Mike, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been such an awesome uh, time speaking with you. Well, Chris, thank you.